This is the first lecture of our series. We're going to be talking on convex ancient solutions to curve shortening flow. And as uh, described in the brief introduction, the goal of these lectures are to prove the classification of these solutions. So in the first lecture, we're going to give an introduction on curve shortening flow and convex curves. So let's start with curve shortening flow. We're going to abbreviate this as CSF and look at a family gamma T of embedded curves. Gamma T that lie in R2. And we'll say that this family satisfies curve shortening flow if the following equation is satisfied. So we have dt gamma xd, this is a parameterization of our curve, is equal to minus kappa times the vector nu. So this um, little gamma is a parameterization of our curves, or the family of curves. Okay, and in my parameterization, I uh, use capital gamma for the space variable and I is the time interval. Kappa here is the curvature of the curve. And nu is the outward pointing unit norm. Okay, and for the parameterization, we mean that gamma t, this gives me the curve gamma t. Okay, so I'm gonna be using always embedded curves. So in the general, definition of the flow, this is not necessary. We can just be talking about immersed curves, but we will we'll restrict ourselves to embedded curves. Um, right, so now let's look at what does curve shortening flow do. First, first observation is that curve shortening flow moves a curve so that it lengths, its length decreases as rapidly as possible. Okay, so it's the gradient flow of the length. So this length decreases as rapidly as possible. And curve shortening flow is a special case of mean curves, mean curves of flow. What do I mean a special case? I mean the, the one dimensional case. Okay. Um, MCF st stands for mean curvature flow. Okay, and this is the higher dimensional analog. Here with mean curvature flow, we mean that the speed is equal to mean curvature dot uh, with a norm normal. Okay, so instead of kappa, we have the mean curvature. But it, for these lectures, we're just gonna stick with dimension one. Okay, so just to see a picture here, if I have any embedded curve, let's make it close. Everywhere where the curve uh, is like here, the curve is gonna move forwards. Um, I mean, inwards by mean curve flow, okay? Whereas in a point like here, it's gonna move upwards. And the more the curve curves, the faster the speed is, okay? Because how much the curve curves is given by the curvature 
of the curve. Okay, so let's give some definitions of solutions. The first one I want to give is that of an ancient solution, which is central for our lectures here. So we would say that gamma t is ancient if it existed for all time in the past. Equivalently, if the time interval of existence contains minus infinity t0, okay, for some t0 and r. And by time translation, because the equation is in very under time translation, we can assume this t0 to be 0. So let me remark this here. So by time translation, we will always consider t0 to be equal to 0. Okay, now why are we interested in this ancient solutions? Because these ancient solutions, they model singularities of the flow. And I'll say what I mean by this. What are singularities of the flow? So in general, this is true for any dimension, not just correction in flow, but in general for mean curvature flow. The problem is that the mean curvature might go to infinity, okay? This means that the right-hand side of our equation goes to infinity and therefore it, the equation doesn't make sense anymore, okay? I mean about the equation here. Now, if this happens, we want to study how our solution looks like when the curvature goes to infinity. And this is done by zooming in around an area where the curvature becomes very large and looking what is happening there. The correct mathematical procedure to do that is by taking a parabolic rescaling. This is the zooming in. And once we do this, we obtain a new solution, which has the extra property that it is ancient. And therefore, we say that ancient solutions that model singularities of the flow. And this is the reason why we're interested in this kind of solutions, because understanding them and knowing how all the solutions look like will help us understand how the singularities of the flow um, develop. Right, now for curves on the flow and for embedded curves, for curves like the one I drew here, simple closed curves, there is a theorem that says that, um, it's like a theorem by Grayson that says that the flow will keep, well the curve will keep flowing under curves on the flow until it becomes extinct at a round point. So the curve will not develop singularities, but only at the time where the whole curve has disappeared. Of course, this is um, for simple closed curves. And in higher dimensions, things are much more complicated. And there is even more important to understand how ancient solutions look like. But here we'll stick at dimension one. Now, another definition that we need is that of compact. We'll say that gamma t is compact if gamma, the space parameter, is equal to S1. Okay, so here, this gamma, when I looked at my parameterization, when this is S1, then we're talking about compact solutions. Okay, compact solution stays compact, so it's always parameterized under S1. And a final thing is convex. We'd say that the solution gamma t is convex if all time slices gamma t 
are convex. However, convexity is a property that is preserved under Kirchhoff flow. So if you start by something convex, it will remain convex. Okay, so let me remark this here. The convexity is preserved under preserved under Kirchhoff flow. All right, so let's move on to some examples. The easiest example is that of the shrinking circle. The shrinking circle is given by gamma t equals the circle of radius minus 2t. And T runs from minus infinity up to zero. Okay, so this is a um, convex compact solution. Here it's easy to find the solution because of its symmetry. The radius here, RT, is given by square root of minus 2t. Why? Because dr dt is equal to one over square root of minus two t, which is equal to the curvature of the t times slice. Okay, so the uh, curvature of a circle of radius r is one over r, and this is why the correct radius at time t for the shrinking circle is square root of minus two t. Okay, so this in fact comes from solving the or the dr dt equals one over r, and we get the solution here. Another more trivial example is that of the stationary line. Okay, if I look at the stationary, if I look at a line, and for each time I consider the same line, that's why I call it a stationary line. This satisfies Kraft-Jordan flow because the mean curvature equals zero and the speed equals zero. A more interesting solution is the Grim Reaper. The Grim Reaper looks as follows. It is a graph that lies between two parallel lines of width Pi. It is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. Uh, sorry, yeah, with respect to the y-axis. Okay, it should pass here for zero. This is here, my E1, E2. This, what I've drawn here, is a graph of the function y of x equals minus log cosine of x. So I'm going to consider this curve gamma 0 to be x, y, x, right? The graph of this function. And I'm going to take the curves gamma t to be equal to gamma 0 plus t times e2. So I take this curve and I translate it with speed one upwards. Okay, t can run from minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay, so it can also go downwards. This in fact is a solution to curve shortening flow. Why? Because if I look at d gamma T dt, the normal speed of this. Uh, well, let me just say d gamma dt here is equal to e2. So if I dot it with the normal to the um, 
to the curve, okay, the outward pointing unit normal, then what I'm getting, it's easy to compute that this is minus cosine x, which is equal to minus kappa nu nu, okay? Kappa here, you can compute the curvature of this curve and it is equal to cosine x. Okay, this is the curvature of gamma zero and curvature of gamma t. So this here, gamma t, is in fact a translating solution. Okay, so we call it a translate solution because under curve solving flow, it just translates. And it is also a convex and non-compact. So these <clears throat> translating solutions are special cases of ancient solutions. They have this extra property that they move on to translation and therefore they can be described by just one slice. Okay, so here we see that they are described by the gamma zero slice and then the rest is just translations of this guy. <clears throat> okay, so some more examples. We have the paper clip or angular oval. Which looks as follows. Again, this is between two parallel lines of width pi. But now this is a compact solution that looks like this. So let me put, uh, this is zero. This solution is symmetric with respect to both the axes. It is a compact convex ancient solution. Okay, so it runs from minus infinity up to zero. Okay, here I have minus pi over two, pi over two, the two vertical lines. And as, as time goes to minus infinity, this tip here starts looking more and more like the Grim Reaper. Okay, so as t goes to minus infinity, looks like the Green Reaper. Of course, the same thing happens up here. And in the middle, as T goes to minus infinity, it approaches to parallel line of width pi. Okay, this happens for any compact set. It's gonna look like two parallel lines. Whereas at the um, tips here, the red regions, to see what is happening, we need to take this point, translate it to zero and let T go to minus infinity. So this solution here has a precise expression. It's given by cosine X equals ET hyperbolic cosine Y. Okay, this is for t minus infinity up to zero. Okay, so this box here equation describes the t slice. Okay, now as a last example, we have the hair clip. In this solution we get if in this 
box equation, we change the right hand side from hyperbolic cosine to hyperbolic sine. And now by doing this change, there is no, um, this makes sense for all x and the solution looks like this. Okay, and it continues. So this solution looks like a bunch of Grim Reapers that come from above and a bunch of Grim Reapers that come from below. This solution exists for all times, for, for all times. And therefore, when we have this property, it is called an eternal solution. Okay, this is also non-compact and non-convex. Okay, and again here, we have these regions as with the paper clip, as t goes to minus infinity, they look more and more like green reapers. Whereas as t goes to plus infinity, the solution converges to the x-axis. Okay, and this is locally um, in any complex set. Okay, it's gonna converge to this line here. All right, so now we can state our goal. Okay, and our goal is to classify all embedded convex ancient solution. In there two theorems we will describe. The first one is by Hamilton, Pascalopoulos, and Sesson. And they prove that the compact ones. They can be only two different ones. And these are the shrinking circle and the angular oval. Okay, now the second um, theorem we will discuss is um, more recent and it's with Langford and Tinalia. And we showed that you can remove the compactness hypothesis and then you get, apart from the shrinking circle and the angular over, you get the stationary line. And the green rib. Okay, and I'm going to discuss both of these um, proofs because they're also different in nature. The first one 
is more uh, PD based, whereas the second one is more uh, geometric based. Now, when I say classify and I say all solutions, there are you know, string, circle, and angular normal, this is modulo sum um, symmetries. So when we say classify, we always mean modulo uh, space time, space time translations. spatial rotations and parabolic rescale. Okay, so these uh, three operations, they give you families of solutions. Okay, so if you have a solution, you time translate it with respect to any T0, you get another solution, okay? So, so we mod up these operations. Okay. Now, before we, um, before we go into looking at the first theorem, the Hamilton Escalable Assessment Theorem, I wanna briefly mention some things that we're gonna use on uh, convex curves. Okay, and we'll end this first lecture with that. Okay, so when we have a convex curve, we have a very nice parameterization, which will make a lot of use. So the curve, let's draw it, a part of the curve, and let's draw the x-axis. Okay, so at a point of the curve, I'm gonna draw the tangent vector. And I'm gonna call theta the angle between the tangent vector and the x-axis. So this theta will be called the turning angle parameterization. Well, when we parameterize by this um, theta, we're gonna call it the turning angle parameterization. And it's such that, okay, the, let me draw the normal as well. What is tau? Tau is cosine theta, sine theta. And the normal is sine theta minus cosine theta. Okay, so this is a useful parameter, a useful, <coughs> excuse me, a useful parameterization for a convex curve. Okay, and of course it works for convex curves because they each point for a theta, there's a unique uh, such point. Okay, so now by using this parameter, we will write um, a curve gamma theta is x theta y theta. And note that if by S, I write the arc length parameterization, it is not difficult to see that the way that the two are related is by DDS equals kappa DD theta. Okay, so this is how we can switch between derivatives with respect to S and theta. Okay, then what happens for a given angle theta zero I can compute gamma theta minus gamma theta zero okay as the integral between theta zero and theta gamma prime of u du. Okay, here with gamma prime, we went derivative with respect to theta. Okay, so by using the box formula above, I can write this as d gamma ds times one over gamma. But d gamma ds 
is the tangent vector. So I get here integral of cosine u over kappa, comma, sine u over kappa du. Okay, so here, of course, because I have a vector, vector, right? So I'm putting together the difference of the x and the difference of the y coordinates. In other words, this means that x theta minus x theta zero is equal to integral theta zero to theta of cosine u over kappa du and y theta minus y theta zero is equal theta zero over theta sine u over kappa du. Okay, and note that for closed curves, okay, for closed curves, I have a point for every theta, okay? And then if I look at this, for example, and go from theta zero to theta zero plus two pi, I have returned the same point. Therefore, the integral between zero and two pi of cosine u over kappa du should be zero. And the same for the y. Okay, so looking at these formulas here, with the x and the y for a convex curve, we see that kappa, the curvature determines gamma, okay? So once, once we are given a specific function of, a specific function of kappa with respect to theta, then this determines our curve gamma, okay? And this uh, we'll use a lot. So let's stop here.